Yeah, you're right. There is this uh, sort of notion that um, maybe you can goof off and play around on the ground floor, Mm -hmm. uh, but once you're ready to get serious, that's when you jump on the escalator. That's when you start heading on the the marriage track or whatever it might be. Right. It lends itself to thinking that that's like the valid way of doing it. That's the serious Mm -hmm. way of doing it. If you're not including these certain components of it, then you have commitment issues or or whatever. Like, um, I don't know. I'm personally in a place where I just, I'm just really trying to remove all these qualifications from everything, from our humanity. I am not good, nor I am, uh, am I bad. There's no God. So like, <laughs> <laughs> I am me and I am my humanity and I am who I am. And these relationships that we engage in intentionally and consensually with full knowledge of everyone, they are what they are and they're valuable because people choose for it, for them to be that way. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, I mean, that's another thing that really excites me about ethical non-monogamy, that it's just, it's very intentional and you, you know, you choose what is right for you. Also kind of going off that as well, um, saying that a relationship is serious or not serious could, uh, potentially hinder your ability to emotionally connect with somebody. Cause if you're saying, oh, it's not serious, you're cutting, you're cutting off the ability to really connect with that other person, I feel like. And and again, the level or the depth of connection is variable. Uh, You have the right to negotiate Mm -hmm. that uh, so long as you're doing it with open eyes. And yeah, it does feel like sort of an arbitrary restriction that you might put on yourself unknowingly Mm -hmm. to suggest that like, okay, I'm I'm in medical school Mm -hmm. in Terrence's case or, or whatever else and just be like, you know, I, I'm not willing to have a uh, significantly invested, emotionally vulnerable relationship right now. That's a totally different decision yeah. right. than to just walk in and say, well, we're just going to have a casual relationship. Mm-hmm. And then three months later, be like, oh, no, I caught feelings. Run away. <laughs> right? you know? uh, oh, that's the funniest uh, thing when people are like, oh, casual sex is dangerous. It leads to emotional investment. And I'm, oh, always no! like, and I'm like, oh, no, emotional investment in other people. Oh. How terrifying. <laughs> the humanity. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I use that word because I, I do see that as like core and base to who we are Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that seemingly you you listed off like a a half dozen different books about polyamory uh, and seemingly all of them at some point in the first couple of chapters uh, bring up this idea that conventionally or stereotypically uh, men are more concerned with sexual monogamy Mm -hmm. and women are more concerned with emotional monogamy. Mm. I don't know how much I really cleave to that notion. I think that there may be some validity to it in like a 60-40% sort of split uh, more than anything. I don't think it's as dramatic as maybe a lot often people make it. But as we're having this conversation, I I do think it's important to point out that we're talking about both types of monogamy or, or maybe even not both. We could probably list off several different types of monogamy and there's sexual monogamy there is romantic monogamy there is netflix monogamy i mean (laughs) there really are obligations and promises that we make to each other to you know i you're the only one that i go hang gliding with you know Mm -hmm. that's our special thing you're the Mm -hmm. only one that i allow to tie me up you know there there are these different activities that we are doing with our friends, even our relatives. I mean, they're not inherently sexual or romantic in nature uh, that we then get to choose whether or not we're going to share it with this person and we choose whether or not to share any of a thousand different things with this person. And, you know, each person gets to check a certain number of boxes. Yeah, right. It's go fish, man. Yeah. (laughs) So I I guess I can imagine why somebody would be sitting at home right now feeling a little overwhelmed, a little bit of that choice paralysis, and just a little terrified because it does feel a little bit like the wild, wild west out in, you know, non-monogamy land. Mm Mm-hmm. It is, and it's terrifying at first. It really is. But getting educated and talking to other folks and um, spending time with yourself, like spending time with yourself, feeling your feelings, like mindfulness and self-awareness cannot be overemphasized in literally anything that we ever talk about ever as humans. Mm -hmm. Um, Being aware of, of yourself, and I think escalator relationships lend it themselves to you not having to be aware mm-hmm. of what you want, of you not considering other options that are available to you that, um, that you could do. And so, so approaching the concept of ethical non-monogamy, non-monogamy can be overwhelming 
Um, because yeah, now you have, um, autonomy and like (laughs) choices and variety and the whole world is open to you. And I mean, that's kind of how I felt when I left religion too. Like it was overwhelming. It's like religion gave me this structure that felt safe safe-ish and like it gave me a world looking back not so much but in the moment it felt safe it's confining but it does simplify your life in a lot of ways it does and i think to an extent humanity wants that yeah and so it is hard it is hard it is hard to leave religion and to learn how to engage in the world that you never knew really existed. Mm-hmm. Like, it's hard to catch up with culture. What, yeah. you know, like, I've done a lot of catching up on, like, I thought, oh, once I left religion, I'm hella woke. Like, I get it all now. But then I, I had to deconstruct a lot of white supremacy yes. within myself. I had to deconstruct a lot of transphobia, a lot of homophobia, a lot of internalized misogyny, a lot of... Um, narratives around uh, performative sex within relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot to deconstruct, and it is it's it's fucking tough. It's tough, but it's so rewarding. And and um, the the way that I've stepped off the escalator has felt very authentic and fulfilling for me. Um, and I can't even uh, overemphasize how comfortable I feel with myself now, and how comfortable I feel asserting asserting myself, saying what I feel and what I want in my life. I'm no longer afraid of hurting my spouse's feelings by asserting how I feel Mm -hmm. because he can own those feelings and and what I feel and what I need is important. And I'm not going to pre-own his reaction. Um, My vulnerability, my honesty, my needs are really important too. Um, So just the sum of that just is that it it is hard, but we're doing hard things all the time. A lot of people that are watching, if you've left religion, you've done this. You've done this. And so this is just another level of this. This is another opportunity for you to engage in the world in a way that doesn't restrict you to what society is telling you to do, yet maintain your integrity and your ethics. Right. Also, going back to what you said about having that first and foremost relationship with yourself, uh, in moments where it might be emotionally tense or fraught or... Uh, you are feeling things you don't want to be feeling or maybe a relationship isn't working out, uh, knowing that you have that relationship with yourself uh, is going to save you ultimately. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I mean, I can't even list the amount of things that I've gotten out of getting off the escalator for me. And for me, getting off the escalator really mostly entailed being non-monogamous and the, the amount of insecurity that brought up for me. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. I had no idea it was there because, <laughs> again, like in monogamy, it was protecting me. It was protecting right. me from the insecurity because I felt the stability that I was in this relationship that we were going to go all the way to the top and we win when he dies because <laughs> you know you're going to die first, honey. <laughs> oh, even, even though like the concept of jealousy or of possessiveness in a lot of mainstream culture within the monogamous culture is considered romantic Mm. it's it's a part of the narrative and you're like oh if i feel jealous or anxious and let that dictate my relationship that's what they're doing in the movies Mm. like that must be okay we we talked to uh dr ray on july 4th about uh movies and pop music Mm. and culture and how uh just how pervasive this notion of a romantic that's actually kind of terrifyingly creepy and possessive, yeah. uh, these ideas are. I mean, it's it's hard to watch any movie that's aged more than maybe 10 <laughs> oh, years. Oh, it's bad. Uh, I watched P.S. I Love You the other night. Oh, no. I couldn't. I had to shut it off. Yeah. I was like, I can't. I, this is like a horror film. I know. <laughs> like even shows like I just finished watching the first season of Afterlife with Ricky Gervais and I was like, Ricky Gervais, he's an atheist. Yeah, I'm going to like this shit. But the whole thing, and I, maybe this is the point he's trying to make, is that he had this very toxic, in my opinion, sorry anyone that really, really <laughs> dug it, but I felt, I interpreted that he had a very toxically codependent relationship with his wife that he like, uh, I'm... I don't know how to like talk around this without being really dismissive of the grief that you would have if your spouse were to die or your partner were to die. But part of me just felt like so much of his grief had to do with his identity being so wrapped up in that relationship. And I'm, as I'm even saying it, I'm like, I don't know, that might seem really, that might be a little bit more judgy than I want to be. But it is, it is that, that, um, that toxic 
um, codependency and like seeing that in media now. It's uh, or every classic movie where oh yeah the chick has two dudes like pining after her and she's like which one do I pick this one or that one and now that I become poly it, well, it's like, not even a matter of los dos. <laughs> and, and for a lot of those movies uh, it's not even a question of who is she gonna pick and it's a question of which her. one's gonna win yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. it's totally a competition between the men uh-huh. uh, her as, her choice is basically assumed right yeah you know right. Oh, even like the uh, the Bachelor franchise. Oh. <laughs> like, oh no, you're dating thirteen people for most of the time, but then you have to pick one at the end. It's like, I'm in love with two I've people. What do just I do? Loved like the concept of that show. Like, yeah. we're going to find a great monogamous relationship by starting off <laughs> with, with this like weird misogynist people. tribe. You oh know? Oh my gosh. Okay. Uh, well, these are exciting ideas. Uh, I, I feel like we we have done the thing that so often happens where you start to pull at the thread of some of these uh, Judeo-Christian assumptions and just sort of the culture that we live in. And once you challenge one idea, you know, for a lot of us, that first idea was just the very notion of religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but once you start to challenge that, everything else starts to fall away. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now that you you... I'm going to borrow a Bible metaphor. Once you have those scales fall off of your eyes, you start to see that you have so many options and so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I know it can be a a little intimidating, but I think the good news here is that this is all good news. This is something that everybody is already intuitively doing, just not necessarily with a strong vocabulary, with a a good intentionality, or with a set of uh, intentionally developed skills like radar, like some of these other things that we're going to provide links and resources to and and things like that. Um, I I guess the tone of all of this can feel very overwhelming, but I just want to remind everybody listening that uh, these are all things you're already doing. We're just talking about some really great tools to make it easier. Mm-hmm. And your feelings are valid. Yeah, yeah your, yeah. your feelings of being intimidated, your feelings of being overwhelmed, if that's where you're at, mm-hmm. I, I think are pretty human because yeah. we have lived in this culture where from as early as you were young enough to be able to watch a cartoon on TV, mm-hmm. you have been told... Uh, you know, the skunk dates the skunk, and if he accidentally <laughs> dates a cat, then he just pursues her aggressively. And, you know, uh, we have these ideas from a very, very early age about what a relationship should be. And uh, it's great to know that there's so many more things that it could be. Yeah. I know that, like, when I let go of religion, that was one thing. Um, but when I approached non-monogamy, like, it, it, get, it gets scarier and scarier. I guess I'm speaking to the folks who have left religion and know how disruptive it was to have left religion and had to create a new structure of understanding the world around you and for me to now look at you and be like guess what (laughs) there's even more you You can deconstruct if you would like to and so I I know it's overwhelming because like when I started approaching it, it was very intimidating for me because I was like well I've lost God that was a very comforting thing to an extent because I am never going to die. There's someone who loves me. He died for me. Yeah. There's, there was so much comfort and meaning in that. And most people who leave religion don't just like start dropping off all of the things. Um, but I did. I started letting go of um, monogamy. And when you let go of monogamy, you let go potentially of this codependency where in these relationships, if you have this kind of codependent dynamic going on, it can kind of uh, play that role that perhaps you've lost yeah. by releasing your belief in a God, then then we cl- cl- you know cling to these relationships potentially. I just literally made that up. I don't know if it's true, but uh, it's just something that kind of sticks out to me that it's 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 scary to release these things because religion was very comforting. It gave, it gave us an identity. It gave us um, a partner. Mm-hmm. Essentially, a partner that loved us unconditionally that, you know, we were going to go all the way to the escalator until he died. Well, he didn't already die, but you know what I'm saying. There was an escalator relationship with God. It was very stable. It was very comforting. Mm-hmm. And so when you start deconstructing monogamy, that can be really scary because if, if, you're, if you can't count on your partner mm-hmm. to go all the way to the top 
to the escalator with you, then who do you who do you have in your life? Like it can it can feel very destabilizing. But the fact of the matter is, they didn't have to go. They don't have to go to the top of the escalator with you anyway. They're still divorced. You know, like relationships are constantly in flux. There is nothing that's guaranteed, and that is the scary and beautiful truth mm-hmm. of there not being a god. <laughs> and and in it's scary. And um, the way I try to approach it is to just say yes to to what is in this world regardless of the fact that it's terrifying and to try to do my best to engage with that. And that's mm-hmm. that's what I'm trying to do. Well, great. We've got a, a number of different resources and websites that we're certainly going to point people towards. Uh, beyond that, just in these last couple of minutes, um, that's some, some incredibly beautiful advice, but I'm wondering if there's anything else that somebody who is uh, kind of having their mind blown right now <laughs> might want to do to start. We talked about you know jumping into a, a full-on diet of uh, these different ideas and these opportunities, as well as some good places to get some good education. Other than that, I, I certainly recommend a, uh, a pint of ice cream and an opportunity <laughs> to just sort of like feel some feelings as yeah. you get into some emotionally difficult territory. Yeah. Uh, what, what else can we recommend to people? Yeah, I was going to suggest ice cream. Yeah. yeah. Always. <laughs> like, yeah, this is, this is a scary thing to consider and can be very intimidating and unsettling. And um, yeah, do some self-care and know that you're enough and that you're okay. You're okay. And that there, you know, maybe there isn't a God and maybe there isn't a lifelong partner who you can count on until you die, but there is humanity. And I know on average, we're not super excited about that right now. (laughs) Um, On average, we're kind of uh, worried about what humanity is doing. But on the ground level, there are some fantastic humans in this world that we can connect to and we don't necessarily have to have sex with them or believe in that they died for our sins or anything. Like, there's a lot of, the, you know, that's something that's comforting to me when I felt that instability of releasing God, of releasing uh, long-term relationships. There's still humanity. There are still so many beautiful people out here, and that gives me a lot of comfort. Also, if you're on the other end of that particular spectrum and you're super excited <laughs> and you're like, yes. Where do I start? Where damn, do I this start? This is exactly yeah. what I want. Uh, those feelings are also valid. <laughs> you're not selfish. You're not greedy. Like that this isn't this isn't something that's wrong with you. Like this is a sign that you probably, you know, you've you found you found a place to start. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to have links to all of the books and things that we talked about in the footnotes. Uh, beyond that, you're going to be on Truth Wanted and Talk Heathen and the Atheist Experience. No? So actually, as part of my identity, I brought my business card because I mm-hmm. just wanted to make sure I remembered who I was because I was very nervous before this show. So I brought my <laughs> business card to put it in front of me to remember who I am. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm actually the virtual, I'm a, an assistant for Dave Warnock, who is yeah. going to be on Talk Heathen. Okay, great. Um, so that's something to look forward to. Yeah, so he's flying in tomorrow and he, yeah, so he's going to be on those shows. Not, okay. Not me, I don't think, unless he wants me, but I don't think he does. <laughs> I don't think he does. 